My screen sharing. All right, it's that time again for the Open Network Security Monitoring Group at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Let's move along right into the group update section. So um, we do have a sponsorship document out. Uh, I've mentioned it a few times, so we're always interested in seeing the projects that we have planned and the uh, sponsorship details if you'd like to fun uh, you know, provide funding for us. You can take a look at the benefits that they'll get you and what it'll get us. So please do check out that document. Also on Saturday, I started a GoFundMe campaign and it's actually doing very well within you know, the two days that it's been up. Quickly go over here. Take a look here. We've made over one thousand dollars, and it continued to go. Like today, I think we made two hundred twenty-five. So uh, hopefully, it'll continue to rise, and a lot of the, largely a part of all the number of people that are sharing it, and especially Richard Baitlich. I want to give a big thanks to him. Um, he has like thirty thousand followers and is a big name in the NSM community, and he seemed to um, to endorse. Are what we're doing. So that was that was very nice of him. I appreciate it, Richard. Um, moving along, so there was the UIUC uh, Capture the Flag competition held by another SIG group called SIG Pony, and they do have an analysis page up. So if you'd like to find the information, uh, the, the results and scoring and some details about the challenges, do visit that link. And we... Before you move... Sure, go ahead. On, before you move on from that, I have been handed the reins for the UIU CTF for next year. And so I will be looking for contributors, uh, vendors to donate, uh, sponsors, and uh, challenges. Anyone interested can get a hold of me. Um, yeah, I'm going to pastor you. Uh, <laughs> Great. I think that's about it. Cool. Thank you, Shane. Oh, I would like to see this group get a little bit more involved in it. So it might not just That's be fair. a Sig Pony thing. Right, right. It could be a Sig Pony love UIU, you know, uh, NSM, uh, yeah. NSM, maybe even ICSSP. Yeah, maybe we could do a, a like one of the times when that when it gets closer to actually set up a meeting just for that, and we can actually all work on one uh, creating challenges together. I, or I plan something. on setting up a meeting starting maybe next month, once a month, and okay. then more frequently as we get closer. I think we're shooting for trying to co-locate with. Uh, Hack Illinois in February, so that's okay. kind of like uh, have a big event. Awesome. Um, and finally, in the group of the section, we have a uh, a sponsorship. So um, Gerald from Blue Flag Security actually donated two hundred and fifty dollars. So that was very kind of him, and he'll come on in. Yeah. Hey, John. Yeah, he donated two hundred fifty dollars. So big thanks, a big shout out to him. Also, we're going to move right on into the meeting sections. So NSM in the news. Uh, Shane added this one: the RSA Security Conference bans booth babes. I don't know if there's any more to add to that. Not too much. There's a link if you want specifics. But. <laughs> so at the time that we were doing this, we couldn't really. There wasn't a whole lot of NSM news, at least that I, we didn't see. So um, we started to add some more offensive and uh, other items that aren't particularly pertinent to the group, but we got them in there to have some coverage, so thank I you. I just wonder, like, yeah, that's, I can see a, a few positives for banning booth babes, but if you're the kind of security professional that gets influenced by booth babes, do really want you running my organization from a security perspective? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if, well, sometimes, well, I, I'm actually not going to say anything on the air right now, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> But yes, I believe that's uh, that's probably the fact that they had them to begin with is just like, oh my God, people made purchasing decisions. That that is true. That is true. Right. Pretty much probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of sad. For something that. Right. Uh, right. Hmm. Well, uh, we're going to the next item here. Uh, new Black Arch distribution released an ISO. I'm not familiar with Black Arch. What is that? Is that like a Cali alternative? It's, it's, yeah, it's similar to Cali. It's Arch based. Okay, our planning space. With a, with a large number of uh, penetration testing tools pre-installed. Mm -hmm. Cool. Maybe it's a little bit smaller footprint than Tally. Also, um, there was a hidden backdoor found with using an API in OS 10 that allows you to become root or have root privileges. And 
Uh, and this was basically, it was a local exp or it was a local vulnerability, so you can't do it remotely. However, you can you might be able to take advantage of it if you could found a vulnerability remotely, and then uh, use that to escalate further. Uh, so do check that out. There's a good blog post on that, and it has to do with the system admin API, which uses XPC for communication. Also, um, the B bone, a, an elusive botnet, was recently taken down with. Uh, FBI from the US and some European organizations. So if you're interested in that, do check out that link. Also found out or came across this. There is a redirect to SMB vulnerability that was uh, talked about a quite a while ago by I think it was discovered by uh, CMU, Carnegie Mellon. And um, what it allows you to do is redirect from a URL to SMB. And then the problem here is the SMB tries to authenticate if you redirect it. And they give you an example here using a GET request. The user just went to a user a website or something, or in this case, a H2 website. But the result was that it gave a 302 redirect and the location of the redirect was set to file. So then it would actually try to authenticate this and you could use this to harvest credentials or other, other types of uh, attacks that you can use to gather the data. So if you're, it's affected, um, Internet Explorer is the one that was listed as the, um, the what, what it's affected, any application that may use that. So, and there's, there's those listed. And um, I guess one of the impact is using malicious ads that could be uh, crafted that would force authentication attempts from IE users. So that was interesting. Um, and going, Skipping beyond, uh, Joss Labardi had a little gist up on, um, he posted on Twitter, you can go to using Bro to basically using the HTTP header event handler and then actually check for that location that if that's there and then look for the file, use a regular expression to match for that file um, string. And then if it's there, then that means someone's probably using that. And then, of course, you can do whatever else you want, whether you want to generate a notice or not. So that was a little uh, proof of concept you could use for detection. So uh, going into conference corner, kind of quite a few of them here. Let's focus on the ones that are near us. So um, Hot Sauce is a symposium boot camp on the science of security. So if you work in um, scientific computing and you have an interest in security related to that, then do check out this conference. It is held at the NCSA. Chain's going, I believe. Uh, ThoughtCon is, is in Chicago, so it's two hours north of us. And B-Side Chicago is also having their conference around that same weekend, um, as well as Hamvention, which I'll be attending. Um, and then I guess that yeah, then AIDE 2015, that'll be at uh, West, in West Virginia at Marshall University. It's the Appalachian Institute for Digital, Digital Evidence Conference, which is just a forensic conference. And they also have uh, InfoSec Track, and Wayland and I will be there. We'll be speaking on the tool called Pilot. And then Brocom will be at MIT later this year. Also, um, we have a opportunity. So if you're looking for a job and you want to play with Bro, you can follow that link. So LBNL, the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, and with the nurse group is actually seeking someone to be on via security analyst, we get to play with Bro. So you can see that I believe Bro is in the drop yep, in the job description. So Bro a pretty mature implementation, yeah. I, I expect so, yes. Haven't they pretty much been using Bro before Bro is a thing? Yeah, I believe so. Is, is Ashish over in that group? Do you know? Yeah, I think Ashish is over there. Um, yeah, I know he does a lot of cool stuff. So, John, I added another opportunity outpost if you might need to refresh. Oh, thank you. Yes, I forgot to do that. Okay, and then oh yes, uh, Sand is. Oh, you can speak on that, uh, Shane. What's that? Did you want to talk about? I don't know what the, what else it is besides the talent. For, like, what is it? it? I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory. There's a link okay. there. That's a registration for the event. I think it's an online cyber talent fair. A bunch of different companies sponsored by SAN. So. Okay, cool. Well, uh, do check that out if you're interested. Um, tool trade. And Shane, these are both yours. Could pop one open here. So um, NSEC 3 map is a tool to enumerate three, or to enumerate the resource records of a DNS zone. Oh, using DNSSEC. So the, the scanning of, uh, or enumeration of DNSSEC records. Cool. So 
We'll take a look at the output here. I'll move on to the next one. So this is a newer tool, maybe of interest with you. If you do so with DNS enumeration. Also we have a tool called Sparta. Shane added this one as well. And are you blaming me or you no, no, no. I'm just <laughs> if you want to chime in, I figured you reviewed. No, like I had put the notes on there because I didn't know where else to put them, but now they're gone. So no, I'm not blaming you. I'm just trying to get your attention if you want to talk about them. No, no, that's fine. Yeah. So um, Sparta is a stuff I found from uh, the mailing list, but go ahead. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so Sparta is a Python GUI application, which I guess you can read it. Simplifies network infrastructure penetration testing by aiding the penetration tester in the scanning and enumeration phase. All right, so it's a penetration testing tool. Okay, it looks like it can run, can run Nmap, Nikto, a few of the Hydra. Okay, so that's a way to quickly run these tools. It seems from a GUI. So I'm thinking it's my takeaway right now. So if you're interested in that, do check it out. Um, paper period. So um, not necessarily a paper, but I did get an article published in uh, 2600, the Hacker Quarterly, and it was released today. So if you're at your local Barnes and Noble or Books a Million, probably, on a tool called Islet that I developed which is relevant for NSM because ILED is being used mostly, as far as I know, to do um, NSM and defer based training with uh, tools like Volatility and uh, SleuthKit, Bro, etc. So if you wanted to do that in your organization, provide some sort of training, check out my tool, ILED, which makes it really easy to provide training environments, environments to users. And then at this point, we're going to turn it over to Justin Azoff. Uh, Justin Azoff is a security engineer at the NCSA. He's on the security operations team, and he's also a developer for the Bro project. He's been working a lot with uh, re basically reworking with reworking Bro control, making it a lot better with uh, Daniel Thayer. And he he's done a lot of really interesting stuff with um, integration tools with Bro, and a number of them are including Passive DNS, Dumno, and the Black Hole Router site. So he'll be talking about uh, a few of these today, but his main focus is on graphing data with Bro. All right. So we'll go ahead and uh, I'm going to stop the sharing and you just click the screen share. Share screen only. All right. So what I'm going to be talking about is how to build something like this. Uh, nice very efficient dashboards for graphing bro logs. Um, so it's not something that hasn't been able to be done already using things like Splunk or Elasticsearch. The difference is uh, by graphing the metrics directly, you can do a lot more with a lot less resources. So instead of needing hundreds of gigabytes of storage to store all the logs and crunch the numbers, you log the metrics on the fly. So like the data to provide all these dashboards going back a month or so is only about a gigabyte compared to the raw logs, which are dozens of gigabytes. So how does all this work? So the first component that enabled this to work is Bro started supported plugins a while ago. So I wrote this plugin that's on GitHub called the Bro StatsD plugin, which when it comes down to it, fit this is that is the entire thing minus all the boilerplate that there's a script that generates and not counting generate or connecting to the socket the first time the entire plugin really amounts to two lines of C. So what you do is or what this enables you to do is it just exports a single function called stats to increment with a string and a count. The stats the API, which I'll get to in a minute, supports a couple other things, but increments are the main thing that you want for doing the kind of metrics with Bro. So given this function called stats the increment, I can pop over to here. And not that one, this one. Uh, I will use stats the test. This was the first script I wrote. So what it lets you do then is take a standard bro event, connection established, and then call stats to increment, bro connection established one. And then you do the same thing, connection rejected, and then you call stats to increment, bro connection rejected one. And what that ends up, after it makes its way through the stats daemon and to the metric storage, is that provides this graph right at the top. 
So that couple of lines of code provides a connection rejected metric and a connection established metric, which you can now graph on a dashboard, zoom into it, and do a lot of very neat things without storing gigabytes and gigabytes of connection log entries. You're basically just storing, you know, the actual metric. So you see you get nice spikes, and it's the software that drives this is very responsive because it's it just doesn't have to work over the raw data. It works over the metrics. So I covered how the bro thing works. This is where it ends up. The other component is how you actually get it to go there, and that's by just running a very simple tool called Stats Demon, which you know I have it starting up. That's nice. Oh, I broke that. Ignore that one. So Stats D is something that I think Flickr initially came up with it, and then Etsy helped popularize it. It's just a very simple daemon that listens on a UDP port and collects those individual increments. And then what it'll do is it will bubble up all those increments on, say, a 10-second interval. So what that's doing here is you end up with the metric, the counter, and then the timestamp. So Bro is potentially outputting you know, thousands and thousands of increments a second. But what you don't want to do is send thousands of thousands of increments a second to your metric storage. So this tiny little daemon will just aggregate those and every 10 seconds send what the total count was to your actual metric store. So you can see here we had you know 21 SSL session ticket handshakes. Instead of sending 21 updates to the metric store, we sent one update saying it was 21. Can I get that going again? Yes, all right. And it's, it's a very lightweight daemon. Essentially, you just run one on each of the bro boxes that will be doing increments, and you point it. And in our case, a influx DB server that's also running Graphite. And in about you know 10 minutes of work, you can get this really nice uh, infrastructure going. So let me quickly show. I have a, this pre-can dashboard that I put together. Didn't didn't take very long at all. Still online. Yes, okay. Um, so you might wonder, so you know, you send the data into the system, you know, how hard is it to actually generate a graph? So what I'll do is just change this to an hour speed it up. So to add a new graph it shows the power of the system. You had a row, you had a panel, you had a graph edit it, and I have a metric series. See, it auto-completes. I have a lot of metric series. One that I want to graph is I am sending, I think the, what auto-complete is, NX domains. Every time Bro sees an NX domain, it increments the counter. All you need to do is then say, Here's a non-existent domain. Yeah, non-existent domains which sometimes you'll see a spike in that can indicate a problem. Say you want to bubble up every 60 seconds, and that's it. I'm done. So would you be using this for an analysis tool to find anomalies, or? Uh, find anomalies, just keep an eye on things. Uh, it's, it's a really nice kind of thing if you have a you know, flat screen TV in your office on the wall, we've been talking about possibly throwing up the graphs and just cycling through a couple of alternatives. Uh, so what's the advantage of doing this sort of thing in Grafana as opposed to Spark? So the main difference is, like I briefly mentioned, all the data for this that I've been collecting for a month or so at 10 second intervals is a little over a gigabyte. Okay. So the amount of resources that you need to store this data for months or years is going to be a lot lower than Splunk. Um, then put the index counts. Exactly, yeah. Longer. Could you increase your brightness, too? Uh -oh. I think that may be why it's so dark. Unless it's just the, uh, nope, maybe not. Nope. It's, it's a dark theme, which probably doesn't help. Um, there is a downside in that when you might see something like a spike, there's no easy way to drill down and find out what caused it. Because it just simply doesn't have that data. It just has the aggregate metric data that says, hey, there was a spike. Like a good example, you were having some 
issues with large uh, connection log entries. And looking at these graphs, we found a couple of cases where, you know, the baseline graph was just stuck on the bottom and then there'd be a spike up to like 40 million, which can be frustrating because you can see that there was a problem and the system doesn't slow down just because there was a problem. But yeah, so something like this, where our you know, base level of traffic and then all of a sudden you get 130,000 connections established in a very short time interval. And you know you can zoom in, but you can't find out what caused that. But it, it's really the trade-off for only having all of this data take up about a gigabyte. So, oh, so also, why don't I show? So that NX domain thing, you might be wondering, you know, how hard is it to just graph something? Uh, that is the entire script, two lines of code. So I guess three. So you need to handle the DNS event, figure out if it's an NX domain, increment a counter. So from deploying this and pushing it out to the bro cluster and being able to graph it, it there's, there's nothing between step A and step B. You deploy this code, it starts sending the metric, you pop over to your dashboard, you add a new dashboard, you tell it you wanna see the NX domain graphs and you're done. You don't have to deal with it taking up a lot of space or anything like that. So, and here's the new graph that I added, the NX domain graph. Nice. Plus the, uh, the software supports a lot of nice features for adding data. Like you can, I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but you can tell it, I wanna see values, the min, max, current, total, average. And you might wanna do a, Uh, how do you get, oh, uh, no? oh, this tab. If you wanted bars instead of lines, you get bars instead of lines. And, and one other neat thing you can do, fairly straightforward. Oh, you can also do a table. Instead of that, that makes things nice. So basically, without really writing any code, you can generate some really, really nice dashboards. And then I think is you can still export them as like JSON data if you wanted to share them with someone else. Um, so that you can hear. So really, with hardly any experience in this software, you can you know send a bunch of bro metrics, aggregate them add a dashboard, just click around for a couple of minutes, generate a dashboard for what you want to see, and make some pretty advanced graphs. Uh, you may want to point out how easy it is to set up like Grafana and Fluxy with containers, because uh, they're prepackaged, everything. Yeah, so I wanted to test this, but I didn't want to have to deploy, you know, server just to test this. So we have kind of a test box running Docker. So I pretty much just started up a Docker container for InfluxDB and a Docker container for Grafana. And that's what it's been running off of. So and you're um, using the Tudum ones, right? I guess. Yeah. So if you're, if anybody's interested, uh, GitHub.com slash Tudum, I think, slash InfluxDB or slash Grafana, yeah. or something similar to the URL. So one neat thing that you can do, so the ones I showed so far have been pretty basic, where they just increment one thing, but uh, you can also do something like, so for HTTP, instead of incrementing the counter by one, I increment the counter by the size of the response. So that gives you the total bytes, not just total connections. And then I dynamically generate a status uh, metric for the status code, which, so this one line of code or two lines of code generates the data for all these graphs, the HTTP 200 wildcard graph, 300, 400, 500, from those two lines of code, I get you know, uh, four different graphs, and I can drill down and look at just, say, HTTP 500s over time, and if you wanted to zoom in, so this will do, it's nice to me, just HTTP, I have to click again, just HTTP 500s over the last week, but you can look at all the status codes, or you know, just one or two. 
So you just get potentially a large number of data from just a very small amount of code. You go back to the big the, the dashboard where you have it, where it shows like 50 gigabytes of aggregate or the number. Oh, yeah. So How do you do that? Because I couldn't. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's just a different type of graph. So when you use the little menu here, instead of adding a graph, you add a single stat. Okay. And then the single stat, it's just slightly different settings. And that's the total traffic there? And yep. So it's the bro HTTP bytes metric. Okay. And you just get similar options. And what you do is you turn on Sparkline. So without Sparkline, you just get a number. But if you turn on Sparkline and background mode, it still kind of looks like a graph, but it makes the data more front and center. And you can make the value you know, very large. Cool. One nice thing about this software is also that it understands the different types. So you know, if I told it was bits, it'll display it like that or none. Like that number in this dashboard would be completely useless. You know, yeah. Looking at that, you know, how many commas would I have? But if it was, you know, dollars or something, you know, 13 trillion, but we can be smarter than that and tell it, no, you know, this is bytes. So it'll give you in tepi bits or whatever the proper unit for that is. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all, you know, milliseconds, microseconds, nanoseconds. So you, it makes it very easy to get the right unit. And if you wanted to, change the dollars, like that. Are you using the group by option anywhere in, in your graphs? Uh, I, I was wondering how that worked. I didn't know if you knew. I don't believe so. I've really only scratched the surface in this. Uh, plus, this is the older version of Grafana. There's a version 2, version 3, that's two. in I think, beta right now. Bugs using 2. Yeah, that they overhauled a lot of it. And it's even more advanced. Like, I'm not sure if this has it, but they have a thing called templated graphs, where you can have one setting that you change, and then it affects all the child graphs. One nice thing about it is like you hit a miss with the configuration files to get your source. In the new one, you don't. You can just do add source and type in the URL of the source, like influx TV and the password and username, and it works. That's metrics. Do you have any questions? Oh, it's really sweet. Yeah. So the really neat thing about it is. It's because Bro now supports plugins. It's, you don't need to modify the core Bro. You just run configure, make, make, install on this plugin, and you have the new function, and you can integrate it into a different system. So basically, it just ends up being just yet another way to get data out of Bro into another system. And if you had a large amount of data and you were trying to do something like Elasticsearch or Kibana, and your system was just falling over because it couldn't keep up with the volume of logs. You know, we've had a couple of spikes um, where it's dumped, you know, billions and billions of records. And I think Stats Demon ends up using like point C point one CPU. Like I think it's uh, running on these boxes. It, it doesn't even register. You know, Bro is using, you know, 80% of the CPU on the box. The stats aggregator just doesn't even register. It's so lightweight. I've tested it locally, just throwing like a million increments a second at it. And it drops a couple, but I think it still gets 90% of them. So, which means you could, I think, easily handle a couple hundred thousand increments a second from one <laughs> on one box. So it's, it's very lightweight. Oh, and by the way, I'm using, just because it's easy to deploy, the Bitly stats daemon. There is stats daemon implementations in Perl and Python and C, but this one is pretty easy to get going because you, if you have Go, you can just build the static binary and copy it over to your Perl boxes. So very easy to get working. And yeah, like I said, the uh, all of that data is 1.6 gigabytes. And I set this up. Actually, I know when I set this up, it's whenever I committed this. So whenever I open source the plugin, uh, see, about two months ago, I think. It's possibly 
way for me to figure out. Oh, we got a question from Gary in the chat. Oh, um, hi, Gary. So, is there any chance of posting your example metrics bro scripts? Uh, yes, I can. I can definitely do that. Uh, I might have to talk to Lee. So, one thing I did, I kind of stole. I don't know if anyone has ever heard of Liam Brandle's uh, fire scripts. Um, Redbox, Redbox. Uh, so he had a couple of scripts designed to just analyze some PCAPs and find interesting events uh, for like DNS and SSL. So basically what I did was I just took his scripts and did a search and replace for like print commands with statsd increment. So it's basically just handling all these different events and for each one statsd increment, statsd increment and you get some pretty neat things. It's it's very easy. You basically just have to think, you know, what event do you want to count? Like the one that does the SSH dashboard, two lines. Handle the new SSH event, template it with the authentication status, and then increment. There's very little code that you end up having to write to do these dashboards. So again, so yeah, that two lines of code provides this SSH dashboard with failures and successes on one graph over time. So yeah, I can definitely publish that, or at least rewrite them. Some of them have turned out to be less than useful. I kind of just was like, I need some scripts that throw a lot of events, and I knew his off the top of my head through a lot of events. Um, but I kind of have a better idea, I think, now of what's useful and what isn't. So I might come up with a more standard set of scripts. Yeah, the, the nice thing is it really just does make it very easy to experiment. You know, if, if you know what the event is that you want to graph, you just hook into it at an increment and now you can graph it. So um, were you going to check with Liam and then see if... Yeah, I forget what the license they were under. Okay. Well, if we Gary, if we hear word back on back on that, we'll uh, post it on the mailing list or get in contact with you. Yeah, I can always develop my Maybe own script from scratch. Scratch. or that. Yeah. Like it's really it's really only or just bug Justin. Yeah. That's probably the best. Bug idea. me. Yeah, it's really just th this DNS graph that shows all these different events and this SSL one were the two scripts I stole from Liam. The rest are just. The one that I came up for testing, like the HTTP, that's a bug that happens. I think they fixed it. So, yeah, so that's stats deplugging with Bro, sending data to a InfluxDB and Grafana server. Sweet. Yeah, it's really cool. I love the visualizations over here, how easy it is to make it look yeah. like presentable. I, the main thing that surprised me was once I got it working, just how easy it was to go from nothing to a dashboard with tons of graphs on it, showing some cool metrics and finding some trends. HR up next? What do you got? Yeah, I can, I can talk about that. Yeah, go for it. Sure. Uh, so kind of the main thing I do is like glue systems together and integrate things with other things. So one of the things that we've had, but it kind of needed a rewrite, was a black hole routing system. So it's, it's a common thing that a lot of sites have where you have an IP address and it's bad and you want it to not be on your network anymore. And a lot of places handle this differently. Sometimes it's a firewall. Sometimes you do null routes. Sometimes you do null routes with BGP. And there's a, a lot of projects that do this, but in my experience, they handle maybe 50% of the problem or 75% of the problem. Like, they might be good at blocking IPs, but they don't support auto expiration. Or maybe they support blocking and unblocking, but they don't have an API, so you can't ask it, hey, what's currently blocked? So a project I've been working on over the last couple of months is a project called uh, the BHR system. It's not a very creative name, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, but it consists of a couple of different components. So there's the actual black hole router site, which I'll demo in a second, that handles the web interface and the API. 
And then there's a standalone Python client, and then integration with Bro, and the mechanism that we use for blocking uses XABGP for uh, injecting null routes. So the nice thing about it is the actual site doesn't really care about how things are being blocked. It doesn't care where the blocks come from. It's kind of just like a message queue API server. All it cares about is what's blocked, should it be unblocked, you know, how long has it been blocked for. It has no opinion on where they're coming from or where they're going to, which makes it really easy for, you know, another site that might want to use this, but they want to actually implement the blocks in a different way. Well, now they don't have to throw out the whole thing and rewrite it. They can use all of the code and just rewrite one small component and customize it for their site. So the web interface is pretty easy for people to use. It's kind of what you'd expect. You know, you could block an IP. You say, this is a bad IP. Block it for five minutes and pick block. And now it's blocked. And I blocked it a short while ago for testing. And, you know, I get another block, two, three, four, five. Bought this one for a week. So now we have two current blocks, two expected blocks. We got my block list. So it kind of supports the full workflow. So like a help desk can use this to see what's currently blocked. If they know something's blocked and they want to know why, they can query it. So it's kind of like the end-to-end -end system for maintaining blocks. And the nice thing is well, there's kind of two nice things. So one, it's built on top of a REST API framework. So there is a full API for finding out what's blocked. So if you wanted to integrate it into another system, so our uh, current blocks, you can hit this API and it gives you JSON data of everything that's currently blocked. And blocking is actually um, really just another API call. So whatever that integrates, uh, with the system just needs to send simple HTTP requests, uh, which means that if, even though the server's all written in Python, if your group really liked Perl, you can still integrate with the system. And it doesn't use any kind of weird protocol. It's just standard HTTP and JSON. So pretty much any programming language will integrate with it. So this is what it kind of looks like from the user standpoint. The basic, you know, add, remove, query, if it turns out this is bad, we can click it, unblock selected, and say this was fixed, and unblock. And you notice if I reload, that just updated, because what I have here is kind of the dummy blocker running. So normally you'd have one of the clients that integrates into the system handle the blocking and unblocking. And for testing and demonstration purposes, there is a tool that comes with a client called BHR Client Run Standard Out, which all it does is it implements the blocks to standard out. So it says what would be blocked, what would be unblocked. So if I flip back over to here and add a block for 4444, four, 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 it'll block that. So that's connecting up to the API and asking for the feed of things to block. So it responds pretty quickly. There's a couple of speed ups that I would like to do. I just need to look at the kind of current state of web sockets and figure out what the best way to do it to get that line down from what's about a second to just even faster. And unblocks are checked less frequently just so that unblocks never starve blocks. Because especially when you're trying to react to an incident, if an unblock takes 30 seconds, no one generally cares, but you don't want blocks taking 30 seconds. So I unblock that, it's going to take upwards of 30 seconds for it to just check. Just it's a priority thing. Um, Could you show, uh, is there a graph that you can view to show how, how many people are blocking for some time frame? Uh, I could probably show you ours. Yeah, maybe. We just implemented this for campus. Oh, cool. You want to connect to the Zoom call? You can screen share too. Uh, did you guys do metrics? No, but I mean, I guess you could pull up the interface and show. Oh. I think you have access to it. Oh, yeah. Uh, actually, it's not my thing. I do. So this is actually, that one was running locally on my system. We actually have a production instance of this. It's just seeing one feed. So right now it's blocking 
21,000 things from the Team Cymru Dragon Research Group SSH list. Oh, which I could demo. So one of the things, you know, once you're in a system like this, you realize pulling in a feed, blocking the entries, unblocking the entries, kind of a repetitive thing. Um, and it's such a common task. So I have a class called Source Blocker. So this is the entire code to pull down an Intel feed and load it into the back end, you know, and handle <laughs> handles all the protocol, all the authentication. All you really have to do is implement this function called get records. And this is just the code that you need to pull down the feed, parse it by the columns, ignore the comments. So if I run this, I think I need to basically need these environment variables that I will steal the way. I set those environment variables and run drg.py. It's just going to go ahead and start blocking. So now you can see on my stats, I have you know, expected blocks, 300 current blocks. So you can see you know, expected tends to go up and then it catches up. So one nice thing that I implemented is most of the API calls act in batches. So even though this is loading you know, hundreds of blocks a second, it can apply the 100 blocks a second on the back end. Because uh, the first time I did this, I didn't have the batching. So you know, 1,000 blocks would end up being 1,000 API calls. And no matter how fast the back end is, the API latency and the network latency just kills the performance. So now it does batching in groups of 100. So applying you know, tens of thousands of blocks doesn't take as long as you would expect. It doesn't help that this is running on my laptop in a VM on battery. It's a little faster on an actual server. Um, but yeah, you can see it's just churning away, loading thousands and thousands of entries. And that page is going to be a bit slow. Yeah, probably asking a little too much of the laptop right now. Um, yeah, and the nice thing is, so now I got a query, take one of these IPs, search for it, tells me, oh, not actually, oh, there it is. So it's in the database, now it's blocked. So now someone could figure out what the deal with that is. If you got a complaint or something like that. Um, there's not much more to it. It's the plan for us is to use Bro as a source for blocks. Uh, so if you see SSH attacks yep. on your infrastructure, you can programmatically block those as they're occurring. Yeah, so I have the full integration with Bro all ready to go. The Bro script that you need to run the tool, the Python kind of integration. And this is a little advanced because it has queuing support, so in case the API was down, Bro will queue the records locally. And yeah, pretty much all ready to go. Just drop it in your row server as long as you have all the prerequisites. You can go from not having null routes to having you know, bro fed null routes. So, I want to say when we were testing this, we had it turned on some dev routers and we were just watching it cook without actually placing any production blocks. Yep. And I want to say there was something like there were north of 2 million would be blocks. Wow. You guys see a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> like, had, had we actually been through For how long was that? Was it, what time span was that? It was over like two or three weeks. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. I mean, that's yeah, still, the, still a good amount. Yeah. yeah, and the nice thing is it's all, all basically lessons learned because I've done this two or three times. It's all configurable. You can say what you want the default duration to be. There's per notice durations. I had a feature for country scaling. So you could say, you know, Chinese hosts or Romanian hosts. You could bump up the scaling and scale them, say, eight times as long. Or if you wanted to say, I didn't try it, but it would probably work to set a default block duration and then set the um, US country scaling to like 0.25. I think that would work. Um, so, yeah, supports a lot of different modes of operation. And yeah, it's a lot of this stuff isn't a lot of code. It's just kind of annoying code that you have to write to glue two systems together, you know, a couple of pages here and there. And what's nice about this system is I've tried to engineer it so that it is flexible and is really not opinionated at all, so that it doesn't, you know, corner you into any kind of one. Oops, I wanted my repositories and searched for everyone. Uh, 
Um, yeah, it's, you know, I've seen other sites have ran black hole routing code and it ends up being tied to one source or tied to a specific router or hard coded to work with a different tool. So what's nice about this is like our actual BGP router integration is just another client to the system that runs exit BGP to do the actual null route injection. So if you didn't want to use this and you wanted to use, say your site had an open BSD firewall, you just kind of have to write a client that talks to the API and pulls down the block lists and feeds it into PF. And you could still use all the other components without having to start over. And one nice thing is that it also supports multiple clients. So you could do something like run one centralized uh, BHR instance and run an exit BGP client, an open BSD client, and they'll just all pull down the blocks. So you can even do this on you know, a very large distributed company and feed these block lists just to all different locations from one centralized location. Because that's basically what the API does. It's the bookkeeping to determine what's blocked, what should be blocked. Like, if I go here, oops. if I go here and kill my standard out blocker and add a block, so you can see on stats, we have current expected match pending at zero. If I try adding a block for 5555, five, 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 I don't think I have one for 5555. Five, five. Now, if I go to stats, you'll see block pending is stuck at one. So it knows that, hey, there's a new block. It hasn't been applied anywhere. Something's wrong. Current, you know, isn't matching expected. I start that system up again. It'll immediately sync up. So if one of your systems is offline for a while, it comes back online, it'll sync up the full block list and start up just fine. So, oh, another nice thing that this supports, because as soon as you implement this, you'll run into a problem is, you know, what happens if something gets blocked that shouldn't get blocked? I said, no, let's block Google DNS, because no one would ever do that, right? <laughs> so try to block Google DNS, you get an error, hey, that's whitelisted. Did you do that? No. And by no, he means no. <laughs> so, <laughs> Google, you know, that's a real dick move. I go DNS if you reach you on campus and you just sat there like, no, oh, I didn't. I wasn't, I wasn't expecting to break it either, man. <laughs> no. <laughs> 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 I don't make fun of you anymore. So the only nice thing is that it's game. built on top of Django so we can leverage it for some of the boring stuff like adding whitelist entries. So if I go here and say whitelist 9999, uh, you know. At least it was just two IPs. Um, you know, so that's all you need for someone to whitelist. Uh, yeah, let me I, I, didn't, I didn't block any IPs. I just... It's thing called a bunch of domains. Yeah. And the nice thing is that's also hooked up to the API. So if you had a large list that you wanted to whitelist, all you need to do is do a post. Now I can't block 9999. And so it's, it's all these little details that are important. So one thing you want to do is, hey, we should whitelist our local site so we don't accidentally block our own hosts. And then you realize, hey, but what happens if we have a compromised local host that we want to block? Well, that's what this skip whitelist button is for. So when you really, really want to block something, even if it's in the whitelist, you can skip the whitelist and block it anyway. Nice. So yeah, yeah, that's really useful. It prevents you from shooting yourself in the foot, but if you're really determined, <laughs> it provides you a way out. So you have every right to show yourself if you want. This is America. <laughs> uh, question in the chat. Gary, um, he asked, uh, how did you guys talk your various network teams into allowing you to do this, especially in regards to the batch loading of Intel lists and programmatic blocking from Bro? Uh, I didn't, but he could answer that. Yeah, maybe we don't can answer that. Lots of boos. Lots of boos. Truly, there was a better answer. I got them highly intoxicated and got them to sign agreements. Too. Uh, so, <laughs> we actually... I, I'm told um, our our shop is unique in that we have a pretty good relationship with our networking team. Um, I've met with other schools in the CIC who lament at the fact that they do not have as constructive relationships with their network groups. Um, I find this to be appalling, basically because ours is so good. Um, 
You know, I think we took baby steps. Um, we're not even really taking in feeds and, and mass right now. We're, we're really only taking in one. Um, and the feedback on that one so far? And so far it's been great. Uh, I think I think one, you know, the relationship helps just having that there to begin with. Um, obviously trust is huge. They trust us not to screw things up. We, I mean, we've all screwed things up from time to time, but by and large we don't. Um, I think letting them drive in terms of the testing efforts was a big win because we weren't overly aggressive in trying to put things into production. Um, I, I guess there's not really any magical formula. I mean, you know, a lot gets said about knowing your stuff technically and, and not to distract from that, but it, it always helps to have good personal relationships with people. Yeah, and I'll uh, say at the NCSA, our, we have a good relationship with our network engineering people right. too. Now, uh, another example, we so one of the things we want to do is start pulling in reputation feeds for DNS so we can sync all those to a site that we manage, uh, malicious sites. Um, and that does make our DNS service manager a little nervous. Um, so we're probably not going to broach that one for a while. Uh, for now, we just do all of those manually and on a one-off basis. Yeah. Um, now, I guess the more aggressive play there is that if you're running a uh, a bro instance at your site, you can effectively circumvent your networking guys because at that point you're just intercepting raw protocols off the wire. Um, now, politically, I don't know if that's the right thing to do because, right? I mean, if my DNS service manager found out that, well, and I'm saying this on a recorded call, but. <laughs> Like, right, I mean, if, if we just started intercepting DNS and like any DNS, regardless of what type of resolver someone was using, and we started sinkholing all of those requests to our domain, um, he, he, she, you know, whomever might start getting a little upset mm -hmm. um, because you're basically intercepting the protocol campus wide yeah. um, or site wide, depending on what type of organization you're at. Um, so, I, I don't know, if I had to sum it up, I would say relationships and patience, um, not being overly aggressive in your timeline. Uh, obviously, you don't want it to take a year, but you know, don't try to push it in a or something. And encourage uh, Whiskey Wednesdays with your net end team. Right. <laughs> That's actually what happens over here. At <laughs> well, so we found out about the black hole router. So NCSA is, is across the street from campus IT. And so I work for campus IT, and John and Justin work for NCSA. I found out about this from playing volleyball with you guys last summer. <laughs> well, te technically, this didn't exist until you had it because we had our black hole running system, but it's kind of old and crusty. Yeah, we did. Have, we did have one though, so maybe that. Yeah. So the idea at first it was like, well, why don't you get like our black hole router system running? I'm like, yeah, I'd really rather write a new one. I'm like, okay, yeah. do that. Well, and so so okay, so that brings up a good point too. If I had to say, you know, like obviously. You know, we're like, well, Justin must be this kind-hearted fool for coming over and basically helping us with our implementation. <laughs> but really, if you step back and look at it, it was a mutually beneficial yeah, right. arrangement because you got to test the updated code base in an environment that wasn't Which your own. We hope to get this running like this week. Right. Switch over from the old system. And so, so I guess that's something else. If you could, uh, I don't. Who asked that question? Uh, Gary. Gary, Gary uh, if if you can find a way to construct propositions that are are beneficial for all parties involved. Um, make clear the win for your networking group as well. Um, he does have Thirsty Thursdays, you said. Yeah, Thirsty Thursdays. Yeah. You get him drunk. <laughs> yeah, I, I will add one thing there. So there's the automating the blocks, and then there's having the automated blocking system. And I think it's important to make a distinction between the two because even if you don't want to automatically push blocks into the system, you'll still want to block something manually. But blocking something manually shouldn't involve, you know, logging into the router and manually typing like a null route command. Because right, right. for many sites it still does. And then when they finally decide, okay, let's do feeds, you don't even have the automated way of doing it. Mm -hmm. So even if you don't plan on using feeds, it's still nice to get a system like this up and running because then everyone can use it. It still has the API. You can get metrics and logs and reports and the help desk can use it even if you never push anything into it, even if you're just using it manually one or two times a day, right. you still get huge wins across the board. And so our CISO 
loves the hell out of this because we can generate metrics and pretty pie charts and stuff, and he can go show it to the CIO and you know the provost and whomever and say, look, you know this is what we're doing for you, and this is data. Oh, like, is I'll end the one. So one problem with that is it's actually very hard to generate metrics for problems that it prevents. Like you, you might have issues with machines getting compromised from, say, SSH scans. Right. So now you start blocking SSH scanners. Well, how many incidents did you prevent? Right. Like you can tell, you can say how many scanners you blocked. So you can't really say, yeah, right. You can't really say how many of those scanners would have been successful in yeah. their authentication attempts. Not to like diminish it, but it, it's it's annoying because you can't say. Like, hey, we prevented 50 incidents. You probably did. Like, over the course of a year, if all the things that are being blocked, especially you start blocking, like, exploit kit sites. Right. You know, we used to have issues at Albany. You know, someone would get compromised, we'd immediately block the exploit kit site. You know, how many other people did we prevent from getting exploited? Right. The only metric we have is, yeah, we got one person infected. Maybe you can use some sort of correlation, though, between prior to having it yeah. and after. It's, so, it's, it's hard to prove a negative is right. what I'm getting yeah, at. You know, so, but, and so I guess two things. I, you know, once I pass that sort of thing up to our CISO, at that level, it's all a spin job anyway. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I mean, that's it's unfortunate in some, some, best, in some ways, but... Uh, you know, if you're a sales guy at that level, you're basically just trying to you know, get budget and win hearts and minds for your team, right. clear hurdles. Um, but I, I guess from a more operational perspective, I think it would be interesting. You always say from, well, from an instant response perspective, um, you know, it's often said that uh, containment is predicated on proper scoping of whatever it is that you're seeing. And so I think it would be interesting if, you, and the overhead on this must be just killer uh, now that I'm thinking about what it would take to make this happen. But if you could take all of those IP addresses that you've blocked and then feed them back through your SIM data as indicators and find out if any of those were successful anywhere else on campus or on in your site prior to getting blocked, that would be interesting. Um, and then you could know that, hey, this this one actor was actually successful in logging into three hosts before it got blocked mm -hmm. site wide. Yeah, I don't know. I think that would be interesting. Um, I don't know what it would take to make that happen though. They did something like that, but going forward, take a Jazzy J off. Going back, yeah, it's a good idea. <laughs> Jazzy J. <Jay. laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's about all there is. Like, you don't know me like that. <laughs> Did you want to talk about info? Yeah, uh, that, that's really fun, and everyone should use it. And it's, it's hard to get people interested in it. And I always hate it when I see people reinventing the wheel, writing like one off scripts. So, that's funny. I have a presentation that I wrote up that I could quickly zip through. Uh, so, oops, <clears throat> that is not the GitHub. It's on. If you Google it, it's third hit on Google, at least for me. Clearly, Google is like tailoring results to me. So, an info is about querying all the things, all different data sources. Um, oops, that's not going to work, but this will. So, it's, I think I started writing it the first version probably in like 2009. Where it's like, okay, we want to take this IP address on campus and find out who owns it and where it is. Oh, and what does it resolve to? Oh, and did it set off any snort alerts? And you start just adding all this code, and then you run it, and it just takes five minutes to run. Because maybe the, like, snort database is down or something else is down. Or then you realize you end up with 500 lines of code to just do a lookup. So it's like, okay, plugins. You know, let's do plugin. Snort plugin, DNS plugin, who is plugin. And... Yeah. Yeah, basically, once you get into plugins, um, so what it basically is, it's three different things. And this is, is its biggest strength, because primarily it's a library. You know, you can use it in other code. And it comes with a command line tool and a web interface. So it's not just a command line tool and you need to do screen scraping. It's not just a web interface. It, in theory, makes everyone happy. If you want to write code, you can use it as a library. If you just like using the command line, you can run it. And what it does is it wraps other APIs. So like, I'm sure a lot of people have used things like GUIP. It's like, well, how do you use GUIP? Well, you have to like import the library. You got to create a database, probably, right? You got to do something. Okay, now I can look on my IP address. And it's like, 
okay, that's GUIP. How do you use like the Shodan API? Well, I got to import some module. I think there might be like an API involved. I got to make a client. There's some function and everything is different. Every, to just do a lookup for some IP address or something, every data source or tool wants a different API. Some things don't even have APIs you have, and you have to screen scrape. So you want to build an API on top of some service that doesn't even provide one. And so the big thing is it's a uniform API. Once you get this running, looking up GUIP, Shodan, who is DNS, it's the same way to look up everything. And it doesn't matter what you're looking up, it'll figure it out. So what does it look like? So if you want to use it as a library, you import it, you make an instance of the class, and then say, okay, I want to get info text for GUIP for this IP address. And there's some rendered text. If you didn't want it as text and you want it as data, well, then you just call it get info and you get a structure back and you could say, I want to look at country name. And then you can do the same thing on the command line and say, okay, I want to do GUIP and let me give it two IPs. And it knows how to call GUIP, two different IPs, gives you the result. And there's also a web interface, which I can demo real quick. So if I do the same thing here, one, two, three, four, and it's going to start running all the plugins asynchronously in parallel. And data will pop up as soon as things start finishing. So passive DNS, annoying. One, two, three, four. Apparently, lots of people make things resolve to one, two, three, four. And there's my, uh, sorry, wait, there's my GUIP and all this other stuff. I'll come back to that in a second. But you can see I just looked up a dozen different data sources in about two seconds. Um, so it's all about plugins. You write a plugin, you do your setup, you do your get info. And the big thing is you can render data, text, or HTML. So I mentioned Shodan. So you want to write a plugin for Shodan. So you do all the boilerplate, which it's, it, one of its strengths is you say, okay, I want a plugin. It's called this. I want to cache data for two hours. This plugin only understands IPs. So if someone does a search for a MAC address, don't bother searching Shodan because it's not going to do anything. And then you just call, you name what your plugin is, which is Shodan plug. And then you really just have to implement two functions. Setup, which grabs your um, API instance of the Shodan API, which as apparently needs a API key. And then you call your get info function, which doesn't have to do much. It just delegates to the API host function in Shodan. But the nice thing is, once you write this, you don't even have to remember that. And you write a little template that renders the data. And writing plugins, there's a nice uh, template for it. So lots and lots of related tools. So once you get going, the nice thing is there's lots of plugins. Plugins GYP, Whois, Sif, LDAP. You know, Jira plugins, there's lots and lots of plugins. Um, so you don't have to kind of have everything in one giant code base. So using on the web interface, so one, two, three, four, kind of annoying. Um, so, yeah, apparently everything resolves. So I'll give you an example. Let's resolve google.com, get one of these IPs. So info that. So you saw this IP, you didn't know what it was, you throw it into info. And apparently, yeah, all these different domains resolve to it. Uh, apparently, we searched for it at some point in our SIF database. Team Cymru says it's Google owns that AS. DNS responds. So direct DNS resolves to their Google.net yeah, number thing, where you can see the difference in passive DNS is this very user-friendly list of domain names where the actual DNS is rather useless. And NetFlow Indexer is a separate project I wrote that indexes NetFlow. So this just searched about a year's worth of NetFlow to say, have we ever connected to that? And I guess we haven't, because that's, I guess, the IU Google. We get, I guess, a different set of Google addresses. So we hardly ever connect to that. If I do a different address, let's do 8888. You'll see quite a different thing. So and actually, it should come up because when the BHR history runs, uh, so you have passive DNS for eight 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 eight. Apparently, a lot of things resolve to it for some reason. Apparently, that's why we had a problem. I guess people are just doing screwy things and having domains resolve to that. 
and you can see this local has some data. Uh, and yes, yeah, so our NetFlow stats, we've seen it every single day out of the past 499 days and just about every 24 hour period, every 24 hours. And Slide Advisor says it's green. Oh, and yes, BHR history. So apparently, Megan <laughs> logged 8888 on the 4th at uh, five or 50 minutes after midnight. So this is the basic web interface. But where it gets neat is you might have a lot of data. You can do multiple lookups. So you can come here and say, OK, I want to look up 1234-8888. Uh, let's look up one of our addresses, 148-1482.2. Put any number of addresses. And let's say for those plugins, I want to say, uh, you know, what the GUIP location is. Did our local SIS server have anything for them? And what about our um, uh, NetFlow indexer stats? And I hit run, and that's just going to run those nine plugins all in parallel, asynchronously and we can get the data. And the neat thing is it's all responsive. So if I turn off the NFI stats, it just hides that plugin result. So I could drop back down to nothing and say, OK, let's DNS resolve those three. Or let's look at uh, Threat Expert. And Threat Expert says nothing when there's nothing. So it won't have anything. Um, or the last The one downside is on wireless. This can put a lot of strain on the back end because it makes so many HTTP requests. Oh, EHR history. Yeah, there it is. So things disappear. Things come back as you turn on the data sources. So the nice thing is, since everything runs asynchronously, you might have a data source on campus or something that's just slow, and it takes a while to run. But since it all runs asynchronously and does caching, like, one nice thing is if I sent John this link, like we were investigating something and he opened it, the page will load instantly because all the plugins do per plugin caching for arbitrary time frames. That's really nice. So. And again, so that's, that's on the server. But again, this all works exactly the same on the command line. You can get a list of your plugins. Say, I want to run the DNS plugin for 8888. And there's the result. And you do the same thing on the command line. And it makes it really easy to build tools on top of this. Because then you get the same caching for free, you get the same simple API for all the different data types. And we have this in uh, our, we had it on IRC, and now we have it in our new uh, chat software. Oh, yeah, I guess. So if you're in a, oh, yeah, to the south. So I just need to get. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, Hear this? Clear? Okay. So we have, I have QBot hooked up to this. So one of the things that actually doesn't come from the N info, but it's a similar data source, is you say, hey, has there been any traffic to 1234? It says, sure. We find out that some IP is really bad. We say, hey, is there any traffic to 77665544? And that's below the indexes. It'll be slower. And it'll come back. Did you forget to? Oh, I did. Yes, it's. But this is really nice. So that is, this is our, our chat system that we use to communicate, you know, every day on, on events and stuff. And we can simply put that in there, and someone knows, hey, everybody on the team's aware that hey, this might be something to look into. Yep, there it goes. It's a little the, the caches need to warm up, but like, so if I did seventy-seven, sixty-six, twenty-two, I think it's like I did. I forgot to. That'll much faster. Actually, I'm surprised I've had traffic. Who the hell talked to 77665544? But actually, that's so then you can do the full info where you do uh, N info, NFI stats. Well, like if you didn't know, it's you say plugins, NFI stats, plugin. So that was a couple of months ago. Someone talked to those addresses. And what works much better now that we're off IRC is you do NFI stats. For 8888, and you get 400 lines, it handles it much better than IRC did because you just collapse. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it's and it's really easy to hook this up. It's a couple of lines of JavaScript that just hits the API. And that's, again, another benefit of kind of centralizing your ways that you query things. 
So, and anything, so I would just be doing IP addresses. It'll do usernames, it'll do hashes. Um, so if I am the five string and I search for this, it'll know that it's a hash and it'll look it up. It looked it up on a couple of different sites. None of them had any results because it was just me typing gibberish. But it will it knows the difference, so it knows that, hey, that's, that's a hash. There's no point in searching a system. You know, I could put a username in here for me, and it's going to pull out everything I've null routed for the black hole router. It'll pull up recent logins from Splunk if Splunk wants to cooperate and sometimes fail. Yeah, so that's all my login records. So, and what's really nice is once you get this going, you've had it for a while, you just use this. And so you have an IP address that, you phone, that you put it into this. You have an IP address that's scanning you, you want to know what's up, you put it into this. And it basically becomes like the only tool you need to use ever. Right. You know, yeah, it's really nice. Like we, we hooked up like NetDot into it using their API. So it doesn't have great, or I just registered my machine today, I think, or 236. So now, you know, if we put a local IP, it'll tell us who owns it kind of thing. And now you don't have to use, you know, a separate website, you know, deal with logging in just to figure out. I forget what my IP was. But, and again, the nice thing is that it runs everything in parallel all the time. So if certain systems are slow, you don't have to deal with logging in and waiting. You know, especially a lot of systems don't have a bulk API. Oh, yeah, NetDot. Oh, so that was someone else's, but. So, yeah. So it's neat, like, if you had, like, uh, 4x and, uh, or I don't want to do that, but 44 to, so if you had a list of IPs and you needed to know who owned all of them, a lot of systems don't support bulk lookups. But it doesn't matter, as soon as you write a plugin, you can do a bulk lookup, and that just did a bulk lookup against the net.api in a couple of seconds. So it becomes very nice. And especially because I could have done that exact same thing from the command line, from like a one-off Python program, and it just abstracts out all the details on how the API works. So that's basically an info. Very cool. Very cool. And it, it doesn't really show, but I've written it and rewritten it about four times now, just realizing that, you know, the API isn't as clean as it could be, or uh, writing plugins is too hard. And, and now it's pretty much like the API from users to write a plugin, like it really doesn't get any simpler. It's plugins basically have, like you couldn't make them any shorter at this point. You have the setup function, you have get info. It's actually another feature I've been kind of working on on and off for doing conversions, that plugins can register that they can do conversions. Like you might have a data source that can convert an IP to a MAC address or a MAC address to a user. Mm -hmm. So you could ask an info, hey, I have this MAC address, can you give me the user that it belongs to? And it'll go through the plugins and figure out what plugins have registered that, hey, I know how to convert a MAC to a user. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, my network registration plugin, I can do that. Yeah, that'd be so, really nice. And then that's nice because then if you want to integrate this into a system that might need to do MAC address to username lookups, now you don't have to hard code your site specific data source. You can just say, okay, use an info and if your site's different than mine, just write a plugin that exposes that conversion plugin. And now you don't have you know site specific code. Speaking of that, uh, we have a question to do with that. Uh, Gary asked, uh, have you integrated an info with local ARP data or IPAM systems yet for MAC to IP mappings, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's what net, net dot here does. I have a, a net disco plugin. If you use if you use net disco, I thought I have it. I know I have it somewhere. I might have forgot to open source that one. I definitely can. Um, but yeah, it, it's for exactly that reason. So. You don't have to hard code the disco specifics into a script that's just trying to look up a Mac to an IP. But yeah, that's that's you a good answer. That yeah, you said never mind before yeah. I saw it. But yeah, that's exactly what this kind of thing is for. Is because all systems are different and their interfaces are often terrible and they don't have APIs. 
So you kind of just solve the problem once when you write a plugin, and then you don't have to deal with it again. And you see, you get you get the command line, you get the web interface, you get the chat bot. You know, you solve the problem once, and just everything can take advantage of it. Yeah, it's, it's very nice. Like when we get the new BHR system going, I'll write a plugin for it, so then we'll be able to talk to it from the chat bot and ask it if something's blocked or not. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, so I think here we only have a dozen plugins or so. At my previous job, we had about 30. Just any data source on campus that you could ask it for an IP or a Mac or a username, we had a plugin for. <laughs> and it was amazing. Because you just never, ever had to use another system. Right. Yeah, it's nice to have it all aggregated in one place. Okay, well, I think we're about time now. Well, and almost perfectly for you now, so. Um, thank you for Justin for coming out. Um, I'm sure a lot of people will enjoy these uh, tools that you have you've written. I'll post the links in the chat for anybody who wants to check them out. This video will be online um, probably tonight on Vimeo and YouTube. And if you have any questions, do feel free to post in the mailing list, email me, or anything specific about Justin's presentation, you can email him at uh, justinazoff at gmail.com. Um, all right, until next week. All right, thank you guys. Take care. Turn that off. Stop sharing.